By the spring of 1943, Hitler's invasion of Soviet Russia had suffered a huge setback with the surrender of 6th Army at Stalingrad in February. Pausing for breath, the German High Command looked for their next objective and found it in the salient at Kursk. The operation was given the codename Citadel. This salient jutted out from the Soviet lines deep into the German position, being 160 miles long and 99 miles deep, and a successful coordinated German pincer attack would potentially trap around 670,000 Soviet troops. The operation was to begin on the 5th of July with an advance conducted by Field Marshal von Manstein's Army Group South attacking northwards and General Modell's 9th Army pushing south. Von Manstein controlled 20 divisions and 1400 armoured fighting vehicles, whilst Modell commanded 6 mechanised and 14 infantry divisions with 1800 armoured vehicles. The Soviets that opposed them numbered 1.9 million infantry and over 5000 armoured fighting vehicles. The Soviet defenders were no longer the uniformed peasants that they had been portrayed as in German propaganda. Two years of brutal fighting and reorganisation had forged them into an effective and professional fighting force which was to show in the forthcoming battle. Soviet preparations of entrenched positions and minefields ensured that the German attacks in both the south and the north were unable to penetrate further than six miles by the end of the 5th of July. Over the following days, repeated attacks by the German forces failed to gain much headway and the Soviet counter-attacks prevented the capture of the strategically important town of Pomeri. Modell's drought south was further blunted by repeated Soviet counter-attacks and by the 12th of July an advance of only 10 miles had been gained. The northern spearhead had failed completely. Meanwhile, on the southern front, the German forces had gradually pushed the Soviets back between the 6th and 9th of July towards the towns of Prokhorovka and Obion. Colonel General House's 2nd SS Panzer Corps made the most favourable advances. Due to failures by the German spearheads elsewhere, House's flanks were exposed to Soviet counter-attack. Despite this, they were able to push through parts of the Soviet 3rd line defences by the 10th of July. The Soviets then committed their reserve, the 5th Garth Tank Army, in an effort to stem the flow of the German advance. The stage was set for the largest clash of tanks on the Eastern Front. Three SS Panzer Divisions were ordered to attack on the 12th of July with an aim of capturing Provkarovka. The SS Divisions of Liebestandarty and Das Reich were to make limited attacks in the centre and south of the position, whilst Tottenkopf was to drive northeast to disrupt the Soviet anti-tank guns defending the northern lines. Once Tottenkopf had disrupted the Soviets, Liebestandarty was to begin their operations against Provkarovka with elements of Das Reich supporting. When this position was captured, the Soviet defence line was to be rolled up to the south to aid the advance of the 3rd Panzer Corps who had been held up in this area. Meanwhile, the Soviet General Vatutin ordered the 5th Guard Tank Army and 5th Guards Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Rosmistrov, to go over to the offensive on the 12th of to coincide with a massive Soviet counter-attack on the north of the Kursk salient. Rosmistrov's local attack was to destroy the opposing German forces and to stop them from redrawing. However, German attacks by 3rd Panzer Corps driving north threatened the flank and rear of the 5th Guard Tank Army, so units were committed by Rosmitrov to reinforce the Soviet elements to the south. This amounted to about half of his force and had an impact on the number of Soviet tanks involved in the attack. The Soviet tanks were ordered to try to close on the German armour as quickly as possible to negate the hitting power of the Tiger and Panther tanks against the weaker armoured Soviet T-34s. If the Soviet army was able to close on the German tanks, they may be able to fire at the weaker flank and rear armour of the German vehicles and have a better chance than in a straightforward duel. The Soviets began an artillery bombardment at 8am that lasted for around a half an hour, after which they began their advance. Around 500 Soviet tanks from the 5th Tank Army advanced in two echelons, the first having around 430 tanks and the second with the remaining 70 or so. The main thrust of the assault fell on the Liebestandarte division, who were in a state of exhaustion from the previous days of fighting and were reorganising. German soldiers in the 1st SS Panzer Regiment were confronted with Soviet armour from the 29th Tank Corps, who closed fast on the German defenders. This tactic served to lose control and coordination of the Soviet attack and also reduced the accuracy of their firing. The SS soldiers repulsed the attack and destroyed 62 tanks in the three hour fight. On the left flank of the German defence, Michael Wittmann's Tigers held off another Soviet attack, but with no losses to the defenders. However, these local successes couldn't withstand the Soviet attacks, and the Germans were forced back until around 6pm, when Soviet units penetrated the lines of communication between the German divisions of Liebestandarte and Totenkopf. Also, the Soviet advance was blunted by the line of an anti-tank ditch, over which armour from both sides exchanged fire. 
Despite this, heavy pressure from the Soviets forced Liebig Standarte to withdraw a kilometre to better positions. The Germans had managed to hold their defence line by the end of the 12th, even with Liebig Standarte repulsing attacks from five Soviet tank brigades. Totenkopf had advanced according to their orders, but their hold on the ground was tenuous, and Das Reich had been unable to advance due to the attacks from 2nd Guards and 2nd Tank Corps. In their attack, the Soviets had taken very heavy casualties, with 18th Tank Corps suffering 30% losses and 29th Tank Corps reportedly taking 60% casualties, according to Rotmistrov. Stalin was furious with the reports of heavy losses and thought about sacking and even court-martialing Rotmistrov on the evening of the 12th. However, in the event he did neither and Rotmistrov retained his command. On the following day, further Soviet attacks against Totenkov prevented the German advance on Prokhorovka and the Soviet defence line held against attacks from Liebig Standarte. In the evening of the 13th, Totenkov withdrew from its untenable position and the battle was over. Over 600 Soviet tanks and nearly 300 German tanks had clashed at Prokhorovka, with both sides failing to meet their objectives. It is impossible to assess the exact amount of losses for both German and Soviet tanks, as many sources vary wildly in their estimates. Some even say up to 2,000 tanks were involved in the battle, but this is a gross over-exaggeration of the numbers. Hitler ordered Operation Citadel to be terminated on the 13th of July due to attacks against Modell's forces in the north of the salient and the Allied landings in Sicily that had happened on the night of the 9th and the 10th of July. Hitler was now looking westward. The tank battle at Provkarovka marked the high watermark for the German forces in the east, and for the remaining two years of the war, the Soviets held the operational initiative. Although the amount of tanks destroyed by the Germans at Provkarovka points to a tactical success, they were not able to break through the Soviet lines at Kursk and the battle can be counted as a Soviet strategic victory.